So what are the best slash most expensive coffee beans in the world? And does it even make sense to talk about coffee like that? That's the main topic for today. Hello and welcome to the channel. I'm Esa, aka The Coffee Chronicler. I'm a certified Q-grader and coffee writer. And it's my goal to help you and guide you around in this uh, crazy and confusing world of coffee. The topic we are going to talk about today is something that confuses a lot of people. And uh, that is what is the best uh, or most expensive coffee in the world. So if you're like most people, you're probably already wondering right now, wait a minute, isn't there something about some Indonesian weasel or cat that is, uh, pardon my French, uh, eating coffee beans and then defecating them. Well, I'm sorry to disappoint you. Kopi Luwak, aka cat poop coffee, just isn't the most expensive coffee in the world. And it's also not the best one. However, Kopi Luwak is of course very famous and the whole concept is just so absurd that it seems that most people can't really get it out of their mind. Kopi Luwak comes from the Asian palm civet, which is a small animal that looks like a mix of a cat and a ferret. So Kopi is the Indonesian word for coffee and luwak is the animal. The idea is that these luwak animals are wild and live around coffee farms. And then back in the days, the workers would find the digested and leftover beans from the animals. And since these people who worked on the farms weren't allowed to try the real coffee beans, which was meant for export, they would instead roast the luwak stuff. And then that became a bit of a thing. So it's true that the luwak coffee got a reputation of being a somewhat of a special coffee in Indonesia back in the days. But you also have to consider uh, the general level of uh, coffee quality 100 or just 50 years ago. It was not nowhere near the level it's at today. So that probably also means that the bar was set quite a bit lower. It's hard to pinpoint the moment when Kopi Luwak went from an underground coffee thing to super famous. But there's a movie called The Bucket List with Jack Nicholson and Morgan Freeman from 2007. And that seems to really have kickstarted the hype. Now, I have to say, if I was a Hollywood producer, I'd probably also include something outrageous and crazy like uh, Kobe Luwak in a movie. But just because it's in a movie, it doesn't mean that uh, you should trust everything you see. It's a little bit the same thing as Green Kryptonite or Jurassic Park. You know, one thing is movies and another thing is reality. There's this idea that the digestion somehow makes the coffee more mellow. But if you really understand coffee production, you can just uh, see right away why this doesn't really make too much sense. So just to explain it a bit more in depth, uh, normally coffee is about growing a really ripe and sweet cherry under the ideal conditions. And then after it's been picked, then there's some kind of processing involved to turn the cherry into a coffee bean. So what the Kubeluwak actually does is processing. It strips the fruit skin of the cherries and uh, prepares them for the next step. But here's the thing, even though processing is a super important part of a coffee production, it can't make an inferior product uh, magically become better. So let's say you have a cage with these Luwak animals. If you feed them bad coffee, then it's also going to be pretty bad coffee that comes out of it. Let's say the beans they're getting is a pretty low quality Robusta. Well, then uh, it's also going to be a pretty low quality Robusta that comes out in the other end. And that's basically how most Kopi Luwak is produced today. It's uh, bad coffee in and bad coffee out. There are some people who argue that if the animal is out in the wild, it will actually create a pretty unique coffee because it will only eat very ripe cherries and there will be no delay in the processing. According to Dr. Schwartz, who was on the channel before, the Luwaks even tend to eat some Liberica coffee if they are free to choose. And that will then add some sweetness and complexity that is more uncommon in a more standard Indonesian coffee. But overall, I think we just have to conclude that the whole concept of Kopi Luwak is kind of overrated and suspicious. If the best Kopi Luwak is still a blend of uh, Indonesian coffee, the question is just how good can it really be? If you look at the various coffee competitions that are taking place every year, you have the World Barista Championship and the World Brewers Cup, for instance, nobody has ended up in the finals using Kopi Luwak in uh, those competitions. So what about the super high prices that you hear about? Isn't Kopi Luwak supposed to be the world's most expensive coffee? Well, again, I have to disappoint you. If you visit any supermarkets in Indonesia, you will see Kopi Luwak on the shelves and it isn't that expensive. Here's a photo from my visit to Sumatra a few years back. As you can see, the local price is between 3 and 400,000 rupiah 
which is around 22 to 28 US dollars. So it's still very far from being the world's most expensive coffee. Of course, the market for coffee is a relatively free market, so anybody can name an outlandish price for whatever coffee they want, but I still haven't seen a Kopiluwa producer that is consistently selling this stuff for high prices at coffee auctions. And that leads us back to the question of what coffee bean is actually the most expensive in the world. So what is the most common way for high-end coffees to be sold? That's actually through auctions. So the good thing is that we can actually monitor those auctions and see what coffee tends to fetch the highest prices. This information is open and available for everybody to see. There's especially one auction that many coffee geeks are following closely and that is the best of Panama auction. This is the auction that is held after the annual competition of Panama coffees and you can be sure that the top scoring coffees in the Geisha category will fetch outrageous prices. Actually, they tend to break the world record for the most expensive coffees every single year. These records are publicly available, so if you see a headline about some coffee being the most expensive in the world, it's actually pretty easy to go in and compare for yourself. Just head to the Best of Panama website and you can see that for 2020 the most expensive lot was sold for 130,000 US dollars for a small sack of green coffee bean. That's a price of uh, 1,300 US dollars per pound. And last year, in 2021, the price was even higher. It went up to 2,568 US dollars per pound. Also, you have to keep in mind that uh, this is the price for the green coffee bean. So typically when a coffee is roasted, it's sold for a markup maybe three to four times higher than this. Another thing to notice is that the bidders and the winners of these coffee competitions are actually owners of uh, roasteries and big chains of uh, specialty coffee cafes in their home countries. So not only are these people who spend a lot of money on these coffees, but they also know coffee really well because they work with it every day. I still haven't seen any uh, Kupilu work auctions where you have a similar situation going on. That is people who actually know what they're doing, paying a lot of money for Kupilu work. On the other hand, my feeling is that most Kupilu work buyers tend to be first time buyers of uh, premium coffee and they will usually just buy, let's say 50 to 100 grams so they can tell their uh, co-workers that they tried the most expensive coffee in the world. If you look at the barista competitions, you can also notice the same trend. Geisha is just everywhere. For instance, in the World Brewers Cup, six out of the last 10 champions have used uh, Geisha in their routine. Geisha coffee, of course, also has a lot of storytelling and mystique around it. It's a coffee species that was taken from Ethiopia back in the 1930s and planted in other parts of the world. Then it was forgotten until 2004 when it was rediscovered in Panama at the legendary Hacienda La Esmeralda farm. But even without this history, it would still be a very unique tasting coffee. Does this then mean that all Geisha coffee is fantastic coffee? No, not necessarily. Coffee is a long chain all the way from the farmer to the importer to the roaster to the barista or the end consumer. And if there are any problems along this line, then it will also translate into a worse cup. So for instance, if the roaster has baked the coffee, it's not going to be as good. If the farmer hasn't stored the coffee under proper conditions, then you'll also be able to taste that. So just because something is a geisha coffee, it doesn't automatically mean that it's above the natural laws of all coffees. And what about me? Do I personally buy a lot of geisha coffee? Well, to be honest, not really. A lot of the same qualities that you can find in geisha coffee, the floral and fruity qualities, you get the same in uh, Ethiopian coffees. And since the supply of those coffees is a lot bigger, uh, they also tend to be more affordable. So I see geisha a little bit the same way I see uh, champagne or caviar. I'd love to be able to afford them, but they are still luxury products. So I enjoy them now and then, but not every day. So to sum it all up, the conclusion, I guess, have to be that yes, we have a coffee that is currently the best in the world and it's also priced at a really high level, but maybe it makes just as much sense to look at the best value coffee in the world. But that should probably be a story for another time. By the way, if you're interested in coffee species and more advanced stuff, then I have an interview about Liberica coffee. I'll put it right here so you can just click it and then I'll see you over in that video. If you have any questions or comments for this video, of course, you're also welcome to drop them down below.